Good morning. How is everybody out there today? Hope everyone's having a good start and having a good week this week. Um, so let's start off with some quick updates and everything. First, there was a little bit of a mistake on two of the webinars next week, uh, the one with Dora Sandoval and also with the one uh, Secret Lives of Sharks in Costa Rica. We had the wrong time set in um, the webinar. Um, it is on the correct time as all the others, 10 a.m. PDT. Um, so that's fixed now. For those that are signed up to it, you should have received an email just noting that the time is correctly at 10 a.m. Um, tomorrow we're going to be off. We have a day off to try and catch up on other stuff with the business and try to get some work and all that and relax a little. Um, but we'll be back on Friday with a special talk about manta rays in the Caribbean from Karen, who's uh, one of the members of Manta Trust. She's going to be teaching us a little bit about manta rays as well as some of the research they're doing. Um, this is a special talk. We've got the normal one in English at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time and then a Spanish one at 12 p.m. in, uh, in uh, Spanish, uh, the Pacific time. Then on Saturday, I'm gonna be switching chairs to tell you a little bit of a special story. Ellen, who's, gonna, who's teaching us today, is gonna to be actually hosting it on Saturday, and I'm gonna give a talk about the, uh, kind of take you through a journey of the last few years of adventures and conservation projects and all different things that we've been uh, doing. Um, to show you kind of how Dive Ninjas went from this random idea to what it is today and where we're at today and a lot of the walk, walk through some of the projects we're working on right now and trying to protect Baja and all that. But then after that on Saturday too, we have a really special online course we, we've built with Dive Ninjas um, and Project Aware. It is a coral reef conservation course. So for anyone that wants to learn more about coral and beyond this uh, introduction that you're getting today or anything like that, and how you can protect them or the biology of them and these kind of things, you can sign up for that course. You don't need to be a diver or a free diver or anything. You can even, you know, all you need to do is share a passion for the ocean like the rest of us um, and all that. Course runs about three hours and includes a PADI certification, which can count towards your master scuba diver trading and all that too. But um, we can talk, I can put the link in the chat so everyone can check it out. And without that, let's start with a little introduction to Coral by one of Team Ninja's very own. So today we've got Ellen with us. How are you today, Ellen? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. Well, we're happy to have you this morning and all that. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen so you can put your presentation up and we'll Perfect. get started. All right. Let's see. Also, while she's doing that, I'm going to release the poll. I just launched the poll too, if anyone wants to answer some questions about Coral and let us know. All right, Ellen, whenever you're ready, you're good to go. I'm going to shut my mic and off now. All right. Can you guys see everything okay? Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you, Jay. Hi, guys. My name is Ellen. Uh, I'm a scuba instructor and expedition guide at Dive Ninjas, and I have been super lucky to live and work in some of the most beautiful and remote reefs in the world in places like Australia, Indonesia, Bahamas, and now I find myself in Mexico. Um, I'm not a marine scientist, but I do love introducing people to the underwater world, a world that has introduced me to some of the coolest animals, places, and humans that are a part of my life today. My introduction to coral reefs was on this tiny coral atoll called Heron Island. It's about two hours offshore by boat from mainland Australia on the Southern Great Barrier Reef. Every day before work, my friends and I would snorkel out and see some of the most beautiful coral gardens that I've ever seen in my life. i would never ever even seen blue water, and now I was swimming in crystal clear water surrounded by life and color in one of the greatest reef systems in the world. It was real life finding Nemo, but like a million times better. I will never forget that feeling of pure fascination when I put on that mask for the first time and ducked my head under the surface. It's where I saw my first shark, where I swam with fevers of wet rays. It's actually where I first learned to dive. And it's the reason that I'm talking to you here today. All of these great memories were thanks to the healthy coral reefs there. 
nearly all of the life here in these shallow tropical waters rely on this reef for shelter and food. It's not a coincidence. This reef is the reason they are all here. The reason we are all here. Later, I learned that these gardens weren't actually gardens, but thousands of tiny living creatures. It kind of always makes me think of Avatar, you know, where all the plants in Pandora are alive and all knowing and they're all connected. Uh, corals are very similar in this way. By the way, James Cameron, the creator of Avatar, is actually a huge fan of ocean science, which makes him pretty cool in my book. Uh, what I thought were just plants and rocks were actually not plants and rocks at all, uh, but they're tiny little animals with marine plants living inside of them that are actually essentially building rock houses or what we know as coral reefs. This is how it works. Uh, so this is a coral head, as you can see here. But if you look closely, you can see that there are hundreds of tiny little animals called coral polyps living together in a community on this one coral head. Now, if we look even closer at these little coral polyps, we can see that they are kind of, they kind of look like a jellyfish. Jellyfish here in the corner for reference. Uh, a jellyfish that is upside down and attached to a rock or some solid surface at the bottom of the sea. They have a mouth with stinging tentacles around it. The basic necessities, a mouth and a st stomach. They are the original minimalists. They use these tentacles to catch small microscopic animals that float by. Here in Cabo, we have a popular dive site called Pelican Rock. We have these huge coral wall covered in these sun corals. But during the day, they're closed up like you can see here. And they aren't very spectacular to look at. Still cool. But during a night dive, when you shine your light on them, you can see these corals open up like a field of sunflowers with their tentacles out feeding on zooplankton and other microscopic animals in the water. It's truly amazing. Most corals feed at night, and the difference from night to day is truly spectacular to see. But not all corals can catch enough food to satisfy their appetites. In fact, most corals can only catch about 2% of their food requirements. So they have these marine plants that live inside of them called zooxanthellae that produce the other 98% of the energy they need to survive. This marine plant produces sugars for them from the sun. Together, these plants and animals produce the limestone rock underneath that forms the hard structure of the reef. They aren't born with a skeleton like us. They build their own skeleton. You can see that skeleton here. These little indentions right here in this picture are where the coral polyps once rooted into the rock that they built around themselves, which is pretty amazing. Since corals can't move, they can't take shelter or change their environment when things get tough. Like we can take off our jacket when it gets really hot. They like certain temperatures, lighting, and levels of nutrients. But when these things change, they blame their roommates, the zooxanthellae, or the algae living inside of the corals. Eventually, they kick the algae out. So the algae packs up all its nutrient, nutritious food and leaves. The algae gives the coral its color and its energy. So without it, they turn white and are at risk of starvation and disease but they aren't dead. Corals are tough. They will wait for the conditions to, to return to normal, then they will let the algae move back in. However, just like we need a little help when we are sick, corals need our help when they are sick. If they stay sick for too long, they will eventually die. 
but we will talk more about how, we'll, how we can help corals later on. So corals are these tiny animals that can't walk, they can't swim, they can't see, and they have no brain. But they build all of this, which supports 25% of all marine animals. How is this possible? Lots and lots and lots of time. In Western Australia, there are these absolutely ginormous coral structures, like the size of small buildings underwater. It's truly something you have to see to believe. And sometimes I would just stop for a moment and stare at them in awe. It's truly amazing to me to see how they can overcome all obstacles to save up every little ounce of energy and grow just a half a centimeter per year. That's right, this big pink coral head here grows just a half a centimeter per year. This branching coral here on the right that you can see can grow up to 10 centimeters per year. That is nothing. It took the coral heads you can see here hundreds of years to grow this big. I like to call them Shakespearean corals because if Shakespeare lived in Western Australia and assuming that he could swim, he might have seen these guys during his time on Earth. From the time it takes this little free floating coral larva to attach to a rock or solid surface on the sea floor like maybe say a shipwreck, it can take hundreds to thousands of years before it turns into a diverse coral reef teeming with life, such as the Great Barrier Reef. So it's super important not to touch corals because the bacteria on our hands is very harmful. And with just one stray fin kick, you can kick over many, many years of life. Like Christina mentioned yesterday, Corals don't like the ingredients in our sunscreen, so be sure to find one that is reef friendly or wear a rash guard. A good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't put it in your own body, don't put it in our ocean. The corals need a little help from their friends to grow into a healthy coral reef. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> um, the corals provide shelter and food and the fish and other invertebrates keep the reef clean and nourished. So are the fish eating the coral? Not exactly. The coral attracts algae, sponges, and small crustaceans, which the turtles, parrotfish, and other marine animals love to feed on. They also eat the dead coral, preventing the spread of disease. If there are no fish, the algae and sponges will eventually grow out of control and could suffocate the reef. The reef also acts like a nursery. Lots of small fish grow up inside the protection of the reef. All of the small fish on the reef eventually attract the big hunters like the sharks and big schools of jacks. And when all of these fish pee and poop on the corals, it actually nourishes them with essential nutrients like phosphorus. So how do the animals find their perfect coral homes? Well, just like you and I, they shop around for what they like based on how they smell, how they sound, and how they look. If a place is covered in trash, smells bad, and seems dangerous, you're probably not going to live there, right? Fish like to live in healthy homes that are safe and smell like, well, whatever fish like. But that's why it's so important for us to do our part to protect the reefs so that fish will continue to want to live there and we can have these healthy coral reefs that provide protection and homes for more than one fourth of the ocean's animals for years and years to come. When you take a look under the surface, you can see that everything and everyone serves a purpose. We can live in harmony with the ocean if we respect this balance. By reducing the amount of fish we eat and only buying fish from local markets, instead of commercial fisheries, we can keep more fish on the reefs to help keep the corals clean and nourished. You can find all sorts of animals living in the reef, not just Nemo. Some of the corals, uh, some of the fish use corals for camouflage, like this pygmy seahorse in Indonesia, which is about the size of my finger 
and near impossible to find if you aren't looking closely. These Caribbean reef sharks uh, use the coral to hunt for food. And maybe this porcupine puffer fish is looking to start a family on this patch of reef in the Bahamas. The wabigong shark loves to hide in the coral reef because he can easily disguise himself while he lazily waits on the bottom for his prey to swim past. The tassel around his mouth actually tricks some fish into thinking that it is a coral structure and they walk right into his mouth. There have been more and more times when I take people for a dive and when we come back, they ask me, Ellen, but where are all the fish? The seas are at an imbalance and we are starting to see it. However, there are things that we can do in our everyday life that can help. Reducing plastic waste is huge. It's as easy as carrying a reusable water bottle and grocery bags. Another big way we can help is being mindful of where we are buying our fish from. Industrial fisheries are a huge threat to our ocean's health. Um, always enjoy fish in the ocean, not from fish tanks. The aquarium, the aquarium trade is not reef friendly. I will post a link in the chat to a really cool project called the Coral Gardener for more ways that you can get involved. There are many different types of coral that provide homes for many beautiful and funny looking ocean critters and together they form the cities of the ocean. Just like every good city, there is one night a year, like the New Year's Eve of the sea, where the whole city goes mad, the coral spawning. This is how coral reproduce. The corals release their eggs and sperm sim simultaneously into the water like an upside down snowstorm. These particles of life float to the surface drift with the tide for days, maybe even weeks, and fall back to the bottom as fertilized larvae. As long as they don't get eaten by the fury of animals after them, they will settle down to the bottom and start a new colony at the speedy rate of one centimeter per year. The scientists can somewhat predict when this phenomenon will occur based on the moon cycles, daylight hours, water temperatures, and time of the year. I got to witness it on the Great Barrier Reef once after waiting for days and hours with mask and snorkel in hand. It's not like waiting for the ball to drop because you don't know exactly when it's gonna happen. Finally, we started to see the slick-like substance on the surface one night and we jumped in to witness this party under the sea. Confetti everywhere and fish, crabs, sharks, and all kinds of animals were coming in to join join in and grab a snack. Total mayhem, but it was totally awesome. So we talked about what corals do for fish, but what can they do for us? Well, dolphins are one of the most intelligent creatures in the sea, and they use corals as medicine. A dolphin researcher in the Red Sea found dolphins rubbing against these gorgonian corals, which are thought to have a mucus type layer that rubs off on their skin and provides antimicrobial properties, preventing infection. Because coral can't run away from its predators, it has developed chemical defense mechanisms to defend itself from its predators. If you have ever accidentally brushed up against coral, it can leave a burn or a sting, almost like a jellyfish. Scientists have found that these chemicals are important sources for new medicines for cancers, arthritis, bacterias, and viruses. Yes, the coronavirus could be, could be out, the cure for the coronavirus could be out there under the sea somewhere. Uh, these coral reefs act like underwater walls, absorbing wave energy and minimizing damage to coastal cities and towns from big storms. Without the reef structure acting as a barrier, our beaches, mangroves, wetlands, and communities could face severe damage from erosion, flooding, and the physical force of the waves. They can reduce wave height by a whopping 84%. I would like to see humans try to do that. It's hard to explain the immense beauty of the coral reef ecosystem in pictures or videos which is why I like teaching diving so much. You actually get to show people. This is Christine. 
We worked together in a small town in South Sulawesi, Indonesia. She grew up on the white sand beaches of Sulawesi, eating fresh coconuts, but she never went in the water. She didn't even know how to swim. One day I just said, let's go. She wore a life jacket, mask, and snorkel while I dragged her behind me with my long fins. Her mask was filled with water and she was scared to death, but she was so amazed by the life under those waves, she went back for more every afternoon after work. She saw her first turtle, hundreds of colorful fish, all hiding in the reef just off the shore. Later, she learned to swim and eventually she learned to dive. Now she's doing beach cleanups and teaching the locals about the dangers of plastic waste in the ocean. I never imagined our afternoon snorkels would inspire her to fight for our oceans as well. But then again, I guess my dive instructor never would have thought that I would be here in front of you today. To all the people on that tiny island in Australia, thank you. Thank you for sharing your passion with me and introducing me to mine. The oceans and its reefs are my cup of tea, but yours might be anything. Mountains, bears, crocodiles, rocks. Just figure out what it is, educate yourself as much as possible, and find a way to share it with others. If we all fight for something that we are passionate about, it creates a ripple effect and initiates positive changes. If you do find that corals are your thing and you want to learn more, then join Jay and I on Saturday for the Coral Conservation Specialty Course. Well, thank you guys for coming. If you have any questions, you can post them in the chat and uh, I will be happy to answer them. Awesome. My camera stopped working one second. There we go. Sorry about that. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was great. So let's see. Um, uh, let's get some questions. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask or anything like that? Um, you can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll read them out to Ellen and go from there. So we've got a few coming in already. So Christy asks, what does the aquarium trade have to do with coral reefs? Um, so I had this uh, thing and in, in, when I was working in Indonesia, we saw the effects of this a lot. So whenever the movie Finding Nemo came out, there was a lot of people, there was a huge demand for the anemone fish, the actual Nemo fish. And there was a huge demand. And to meet these demands, a lot of communities in Indonesia and elsewhere in the world were using these really, really unsustainable fishing techniques to capture these fish amongst the coral reefs. One of the fishing techniques is cyanide fishing. Uh, it's where they use, they go in and they inject cyanide into the reefs. Um, and it basically stuns all of the fish in that area and makes them super easy to catch. So they inject the cyanide in, which stuns all the fish and they pick out the ones they want. So they pick out Nemo and Dory and whichever ones they want. And they bring them onto the boat and they put them on fresh, in fresh water and they come back to life. And then whatever else was left on the reef is completely dead. So even though they got the fish that they want and they're still alive, everything on the reef is still destroyed. So when you're diving, you go around and you can see these huge patches of reef, everything else around it is healthy, but everything in this huge circle is dead. And those are the effects from cyanide fishing. So you have to think when you're going to buy a fish from the aquarium, you have to think how that fish was extracted and how it got to your aquarium. Awesome, thank you for that great information to know. Well, the next question comes from Bryn. She says, Ellen, where is the best, where is the best place you have ever dived with coral reefs? Uh, I haven't been everywhere in the Coral Triangle, but um, I have been to Komodo in Indonesia, and that is some of the healthiest reef. There is such great diversity there um, from coral, from soft corals to hard corals. It's truly amazing to see all of the um, different corals, which attracts all the different types of fish, from small fish to big fish to huge manta rays. Um, it's so colorful, it's truly amazing. 
anywhere in the Coral Triangle, Indonesia, Philippines. Um, the diving over there is really, really amazing. Awesome. Some of the health that is really incredible out there. So Suwaya says, cool story about the coral spawning at the Barrier Reef. Have you ever tried to experience that in Cabo? I have not. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been in Cabo very long, but um, I hope to see it someday. Yeah, just to ask what we do see it sometimes here in Cabo is quite rare. I mean, I think in my years here, I've only seen it a handful of times at maximum and never as like an entire spawning at once. It's always been like a couple sections or different species and these kind of things. But it's pretty cool to see um, underwater really, really amazing. I can't imagine seeing it on the barrier reef in this massive, you know, spawning and all that must have been mind blowing. Super, super cool. It's a huge party. <laughs> awesome. So Houston asks, have you seen any bleaching or disease in Cabo? Um, we have recently, uh, we thought, actually thought it was um, bleaching, but recently we had some scientists come in um, with Sea Shepherd that we're working with here. And um, they recently identified a coral disease um, that their testing is still going through because they're working with us on a coral restoration project. Um, so, they, so they haven't given us all the details, but they have identified it as a disease and not coral bleaching. Um, so it is, there is a coral disease that's affecting some of the corals here. Um, it's not affecting all of the corals, um, but we are still waiting on some of the results here. So we're hoping that it's something that we can help prevent or help treat. But um, yes, we are seeing some problems with that. We, we have not, we are lucky to see, we haven't seen a lot of bleaching here. Yeah, it's, it's really been a bit minor here in Cabo I and mean, will be great once we hear back more on the information and everything like from uh, Michelle and all of them. But um, hopefully it's nothing too uh, bad. So, cool. So Christine asks, um, so why does it take so long for coral to grow? And do different parts of the world's coral grow at a different pace? Also, thank you for teaching me to see the underwater world. I look forward to doing the course with you on Saturday. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, uh, all corals are different. So some corals grow a little bit faster. Branching corals um, can grow a little bit quicker than other corals. Um, some of the really, really um, dense reef building corals, because they require so much energy um, and because they're denser, they require um, a lot, lot more time. Um, they're so small, they just require <laughs> um, so much time because if you think about it every tiny little polyp needs to develop and they are only consuming two percent of their food and they're relying on these tiny tiny little plants and they have all of these ocean predators and all of these obstacles to overcome in the ocean so it's just like a, a kind of they, it makes me think of like a cactus in the desert um, these cactuses have so little resources to work with, so little water to work with, and over time they're able to grow somehow. It's truly amazing. Um, I wish I had more scientific background to give you on um, exactly how, um, you know, the time process takes, but they really have a lot of very little resources and they do the best with what they have. Um, this takes a really, really long time. Awesome. So Patty asks, is it illegal to buy and sell coral? And if so, how do you stop this? Um, in some places, I know that um, black coral is used for jewelry. Um, in the Caribbean, it was, it's almost extinct now. Like you can, it's really, really hard to see black coral now because it was used, bought and sold as jewelry. And um, it was like kind of a, a specialty there for a long time. So now it's really, really rare to see on a lot of reefs in the Caribbean. Um, but I don't exactly know. I think it would depend on the regulations, kind of like shark finning. Um, but I know that in aquariums, you can buy and sell, you can grow your own coral in a fish aquariums. Um, so I don't exactly know all of the regulations on that, but I'm sure that they vary um, based on different geographic locations and things. Yeah, I think it is definitely different between country and region and these kind of things. Um, like for instance, in whether or not it's in a national park or in a normal area and these kind of, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so Coral asks, thank you for the informative presentation. Do you think corals can evolve or adapt over time to survive the rising ocean temperatures or change in pH? Um, yes, so there's a lot, a lot of really, really cool research going on. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, negative media attention uh, going on, and especially the Great Barrier Reef just suffered another mass bleaching um, amidst all the coronavirus um, happenings, or amidst all the coronavirus lockdown. Um, but even with all of that going on, a lot of scientists, even in the Great Barrier Reef, are finding that even places that have been bleached are building up resilience. So um, there is a lot of un unknowns in that area of research, but um, it's an area of exploration. Uh, another thing that scientists are exploring is during the coral spawns, because they all of the um, larva is becoming mixed at the same time and everything is simultaneously released, um, it's able to create hybrids. So now they're starting to create hybrids that are really resilient. Um, this is really, really new science, but it's really interesting because um, they're experimenting with hybrids that are resilient to say, you know, different pHs, deep, different um, water temperatures and stuff like that. And say maybe this coral wasn't resilient to this, but um, a hybrid coral between this one and this one that can create a new coral might be resilient to these temperatures. So that's one really cool thing about coral is that you can create these hybrids that are potentially adaptable. So um, I know it's a lot of doom and gloom in the media, but there is still a lot of hope and there's some really, really cool science to check out um, based on this, um, these findings. Awesome. Um, she has a follow-up question. So do you know approximately how long can bleach corals survive before they die? I don't. Um, I wish I did. There are different between species. So every species is different. Um, they're like a fingerprint. They each have their own DNA. Um, and then on top of that, they are creating all of these new hybrid species that are each their own individual species. Um, so I think that each individual species would have a different time and that's why each one is resilient in its own way. Maybe this one coral is a soft coral and it would only be able to last a certain amount of time without its uh, zooxanthellae. And then another coral in a different environment would be able to last, you know, longer or a short, shorter amount of time. So I think it depends on its geographic location and it depends on the environment that it's in. Awesome. So uh, Anonymous asks, what do corals eat? Uh, corals eat so like the zooplankton in the water and other little tiny microscopic stuff that's in the water. Awesome. So but they asks, only get about what should we consider when choosing a location to dive for recreation? Sorry, what was the question again? What should we consider when choosing a location to dive, uh, to go diving? Um, it depends on what you're looking for. So um, coral reefs are always going to produce a large abundance of marine life. Um, but uh, the more, more abundant uh, coral reefs are going to be in shallower areas. Of course, there are deep uh, coral reefs, but unless you're doing um, some amazing technical diving, I really enjoy um, shallower dives because you can find some really, really amazing um, coral because coral needs light. Um, the more light, the more colorful reefs you're going to get and the more fish and stuff like that. So that's just one suggestion, but it always just depends on what you're looking for um, for your dive. Awesome. So Tom asks, are there techniques to grow coral in farms quickly, then transport them to areas where reefs are struggling to promote growth and attract other marine life? What was the second part of the question? Uh, are there, there, you can actually open the Q&A and see the questions, um, ah. but are there techniques to grow coral in farms quickly and then transport them to areas where reefs are struggling to promote growth and attract other marine life? Ah, perfect. Um, yes, so actually something that I'm really, really excited about, um, which we have going with Sea Shepherd right now, is um, we're starting a coral restoration project here in Cabo. 
Um, we haven't gotten all the details nailed down yet, but um, there are a lot of coral farms going on around the world. Um, they are slowly, I don't know if um, there's a technique to grow them more quickly. Um, again, I think it goes back to finding those hybrids that are able to grow quick and are resilient to the environment that they're growing in. Um, but um, I don't know so, so much about um, where transporting to, to areas that are promoting growth. I do know that you have to have the factors such as salty water. They need to have a certain salinity. They need to have certain light. So they need to be in clear water. So the more clear the water, the more light that they're getting, the more um, that the zooxanthellae can uh, photosynthesize and produce sugars that can produce food so that the coral can grow. So I think that if you increase, increase all of these factors, um, the water has lots of nutrients. So I think that increasing the, um, all the health factors of their environment could potentially increase the growth and attract other marine life. Um, I don't know about pr promoting the, like, the internal genet like modifying the coral genetically so that it grows quickly. But I know that there's a lot of research being done right now to, um, to answer those questions. So hopefully, um, once we get our, our, uh, our project off the ground, I'll be, answered it, I'll be able to answer those questions for you or you can come check it out in Cabo. Awesome. So Sally asks, uh, what are the, uh, actually just to step back on that, I think too with Tom, it, there's no real process that is known at the moment to make them grow fast. There's no way to like speed grow. It's not in a sense like farming plants or these kind of things. The corals still have this kind of really slow growth rate um, with, you know, pretty much any kind of, uh, whether it's fragmentation or something else, however they're growing and everything like that, which is I mean, the restoration projects are great, but it's also too of trying to stop the damage to them because the restoration does take a, a good amount of time. It's not something you can kind of plant and get in the water and have it back on the reef in a couple of weeks or something like that. Um, but yeah, so Sally, you asked, what are the differences in coral distribution between the Caribbean, South Pacific, Hawaii, et cetera? Um, so the coral distribution is going to be different everywhere that you go. So in the Caribbean, in South Pacific, the types of twirls that you find there, the types of animals that you find there, um, everywhere you go is going to be different. So when you get in, that's the best thing about, I love about traveling and diving is everywhere you go, the reefs are completely different. Um, like in Western Australia, there is like many, many hard corals. Like I was saying before, there's these enormous, enormous reefs and they're all like these huge reef building hard corals. Um, in Indonesia and the Pacific, there are these amazing soft corals on top of the reef building corals and um, all of these anemones and it's like super, super, super colorful. Um, in the Caribbean, you have tons of sponges growing on top of the reefs. So everywhere you go, it attracts different wildlife and there's different types of sponges um, and different types of corals. Um, I haven't been to Hawaii or the South Pacific. Um, I would love to go. Um, so I will let you know how the coral is when I go there one day. Awesome. So Liggy asked, does the, do the coral reefs have any natural predators? Yes, they do. Um, so there are some fish that uh, feed on the reefs. There are also worms, barnacles, uh, crabs, some snails. Um, one of the big ones in Australia right now is the crown of thorns uh, starfish. So um, it's a huge predator right now. It feeds on the coral soft tissues. Um, and right now, um, it's, the population has grown out of control due to runoff from um, farms, like uh, the, all of the chemicals from the farming. So it's caused this huge outbreak and now it is eating the coral at a more rapid rate than it can reproduce. And so there's a lot of teams out there that are trying to cull the crown of um, the crown of thorn starfish. Um, so that's one really big natural predator. Other natural predators, uh, humans. Um, here in Cabo, um, one of our biggest dive sites is Pelican Rock. Um, uh, recently, there was a big spring break. We have a lot of people jumping off of the rock, um, which is cool. I would jump off of that rock too if I saw it. 
Um, however, they don't know that there are a lot of corals right off of there and that when they jump, it's knocking all out of corals. So a lot of the natural predation comes from humans and our need to just manage um, coral areas a little bit better. So Barbara asks, are you seeing any stony coral tissue loss in Cabo or is it isolated to the Caribbean? Um, we're seeing some here. Uh, there's more so in the Caribbean. I saw a lot of it when I was in the Caribbean. Um, I haven't noticed it as much in Cabo, um, but definitely, definitely more so in the Caribbean. Um, yeah, no, actually, actually the, it's, it's, we have some really, really healthy reefs here in Cabo. Uh, more so in the Caribbean, for sure. Awesome. So Anonymous asked, uh, the, the, how, do, the, how does the coral photosynthesize? So the zoo, the coral itself actually doesn't photosynthesize um, because it's an animal, but they have these, the zooxanthellae or the marine algae lives inside of the coral and that's how it um, photosynthesizes. So um, not all corals photosynthesize. So actually those, um, those, sea, those sun corals that I showed you that we have on the wall in Cabo, they actually don't photosynthesize. They're one of the only corals that don't photosynthesize. Um, but most corals do. So they have the little zooxanthellae inside of them um, and that produces um, the sugars from the sun that provides most of the coral's food. Awesome. Natasha asks if you can talk a little bit more about this relationship between them and how it works um, between them. Yeah, so the corals in the zooxanthellae or the marine algae or the marine plants, they have this symbiotic relationship where the coral provides a little house for the zooxanthellae and the zooxanthellae provides food for the corals. So they kind of live in this harmonious relationship and um, the zooxanthellae actually is what provides, um, is what makes corals colorful, so it provides the nice color, which is why when corals are bleached, it's because the zooxanthellae has moved out and um, the coral is white because that's the natural color of the coral. It's only when the plant lives inside of there that the um, coral is, um, has color to it because it has those little plants living in there. Um, so they need each other to survive. Um, without them, the zooxanthellae has nowhere to live and the corals are not able to produce enough food to sustain themselves. Awesome. It's really interesting the symbiotic relationships they share, you know what I mean, to be able to live and how that was created and, you know, to imagine how it was created, you know, it's incredible. So we've got one last question from Robin. She says, where are the largest coral reefs in the Atlantic Ocean? Ooh, good question, Robin. Hmm, Jay, do you know the answer to this one? <laughs> Not sure in the Atlantic myself, but in the Caribbean, you've got like the Mesoamerican um, barrier reef, which is gigantic. I mean, it's the second largest barrier reef in the world. Um, it runs all the way from the northern tip of the Yucatan down through, you know, all of Mexico, Belize, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes uh, pretty far into Central America. That would probably be, if you consider the Caribbean as part of the Atlantic, I would say then um, that would be the largest, at least the second largest in the world. Outside of the Caribbean, I'm not really familiar. I don't do a lot of coral reef diving, so that's a little out of my uh, realm of expertise, um, but that would be my guess. And then we just got one more question, one more question in from Sally. She says, how much oxygen is produced from coral reefs? That is also another good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not know the exact number on that one. Um, I know that they are like the rainforest of the sea. Um, but Sally, if you send me a message, I will get back to you with that one and very, very shortly. Awesome. So they actually, the, the, the rough numbers is that somewhere around like uh, one third of the, I mean, uh, was it one third of, I'm trying to remember what it is. I want to say they generate like one third or almost a half of the amount of oxygen coming out of the ocean and everything like that. It's a massive amount. It's actually a, a gigantic, gigantic amount. Oh, we got, it's about half of the world's oxygen. Yep, Our friend Gretel, who is a marine biologist. Woo! Thanks, Gretel. <laughs> so it's about half of the world's oxygen. <laughs> awesome. 
So perfect. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you everybody for joining us today. We'll be back on Friday at 10 a.m. with Karen from the Manta Trust to talk a little bit about uh, manta rays in the Caribbean, um, some of the research they're doing with them and the conservation efforts. Um, really, really cool talk. And we'll see you then. Um, Ellen, thank you so much for coming by today, stopping in and all that. It's great to have you. And thank you for everybody uh, tuning in today. We'll see you guys on Friday morning. Have a wonderful uh, day off tomorrow. Thank you.